And so without further ado, I think we're going today hear from Mari first. Yesterday in our workshop, we had John go first. And I think Mar Mari uh, and Mary Love are going to be kind of a tag team here. So they'll, they'll be working. So we'll have them uh, share with us for about half an hour and have some dialogue. And then we'll bring on John. So let's welcome uh, Mari and Mary. I'm going to start us off and introduce you to Mary before she speaks. It's so funny, you do all this preparation and it seems to be coming on slowly, 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 and then all of a sudden, boom, it's here, you know, and there's all these faces in front of you and you're meeting new people, and I want to say thank you for each and every one of you who are here, and especially those who have greeted me so warmly. I love this place. I love... Am I... Get my stage voice on again? That's right. Get your stage voice. All right. Just snuggle on up to that mic. There you go. I think sometimes, I feel sometimes, that we don't notice what our heart is missing until we find something that touches our heart. And that's kind of what I feel A Course of Love is. We didn't know we needed it. And then A Course of Love comes, and it touches our heart, and we begin to see and feel in new ways really expansive ways. And that's actually the same thing that happened to me when I met Mary Love, who's going to be speaking in a little bit. Mary Love has always touched my heart. So we've been in spiritual companionship since before Course of Love began. And what I thought I would do today is talk about A Course of Love. Since we don't have a lot of time, I can't, of course, tell you everything about A Course of Love. I would talk to you about the intersection points where Mary and I came together with it. And then she'll tell you of her journey through it. So this weekend, we're having two firsts. One of them is John Mundy speaking with me. And I want to really thank John because he is a person of such integrity. And he has opened the door for A Course of Love. And I believe that this is helping us to usher in a new time. It's a very, very big sense in me that a new time is beginning, a time of Christ, a time of uh, representing Christ with our very lives. And... Um, and I believe that this is a step in making that happen. And John is so kind. I had a coughing fit at the end of the day yesterday, and this morning he gave me cough drops. <laughs> so, the intersection points that happened between Mary and I I'm going to go back just a little bit before they began, when we were working together. I mean, like I said, from the first minute I met her, I knew I wanted her in my life. I could feel her heart. And so I invited her to work with me at the University of Minnesota. And she applied for the job and got it, and eventually a spiritual journey began between her and I and another woman named Julianne Carver. And while we were there, I had a dream, a prophetic dream, that told me I could no longer sell my mind for money. My mind belonged to God. Now, this dream took me on quite a journey. It was eight months before I left my job because it wasn't an easy job to leave for many reasons, as you might imagine. And it took another eight months before... I would find out what this work was. And by that time, I was at the end of my rope. I was like, 
in many different ways. You know, just that anxiety of, I feel like I'm being called, but I don't know what's happening. I don't know what it is. And financially, you know, my family wasn't doing well. So Mary came over one day, it was actually her birthday, November 25th, 1998, and shared with me a dream she had of a new Course in Miracles. And that was the beginning of me understanding that this was what my work was going to be. I had also been at church that morning, and it was that time, November 25th, it was the end of the uh, ordinary time, and it was the beginning of the time of Christ. Advent was coming, and I felt very strongly, I wrote in my journal after Mary had been with me about Mary talking about this dream of a new course in miracles and then about church and I had guidance during that time of journaling that Mary would have, Mary and I would have something to do with the end of ordinal time. Now for those of you here yesterday, I'm sorry I'm repeating that but this was a big intersection point for Mary and I and it's followed me into this time when I'm feeling so strongly that the time of Christ is here, that we have actually entered a new time. And I believe that a course of love is a big part of that. So the next point of intersection was after I had read chapter 19 of read, received, I had received chapter 19 of the course and the way it worked for me with the course of love from the first day when I sat down and made myself available for it, within minutes I would begin hearing words within my mind and I would type these words and at first they didn't come in chapters and anything like that, it was sort of a stream and, but every time I sat down, which was any time my house was empty, I would begin within minutes to hear these words until after chapter 19. And I went to my computer that day and I sat and minutes went by, which felt like hours because this had never happened before. Response had always been quick. And then when I did hear the voice, the voice told me, you can't go on with your thinking mind. And that was all I heard for the next 10 months. You can't go on with your thinking mind. Not 10 months, 10 weeks, I'm sorry, 10 weeks. You can't go on with your thinking mind. And of course, you never feel like you're doing thinking when you're doing this kind of work. I already felt like I was sort of out of my mind with Jesus' voice in my, coming through me in the way it was. And I pleaded, you know, it was like, well, what, you know, how can I be any less in my mind? And uh, I started to have you know, physical issues, and I went to the doctor, and, you know, I, all these things, and I'm just going crazy with this, what has happened? And I already had, you know, a team I was working with that was sharing it every week, and it was like, how do I explain this, that all of a sudden it stopped because apparently I'm thinking too much. (laughs) So finally, I went to my friend Mary Love, and our fellow spirit sister, Julianne Carver. And I said, can you help me? I'm going crazy. So I went to Mary's house. And here's the way I remember it. I mean, this is, you know, 20 years ago. And she has a little room with a day bed. And they had me lay down in the bed. And they put some stones on me, is the way I remember it. And I had been having a lot of cave imagery during the time of the receiving. And I began to see myself in a cave as they were doing whatever they were doing. And, um, and so I told them, I said, I see myself in a cave. And so they started saying, you know, well, come out of the cave. We're calling you out of the cave, Mari. And I was like, I don't want to come out. It's safe in here. I, I want to stay in the cave. And then I realized This is what brought me out. I said, I don't have a voice here. And I became willing to come out of the cave so that I would have a voice. 
this became important to me, to have a voice. So I'm going to take you, these are a couple of the important, what I feel were really big intersections. This one came after A Course of Love was done. And it had been a very intense time, as you might imagine. And it was published quickly. I finished the dialogues in October of 2001, and it was either late October or early November that the first edition of A Course of Love, just the first book, came out from New Earth Library. So there were all these things going on. And uh, I wasn't going to say this, (laughs) but in that pause where uh, I couldn't receive... And I, my family was having these financial troubles, and they were around a lot. And I was going crazy, and I thought, I want, more, I want more time in my house by myself. And I started a coffee shop. <laughs> I mean, I know it sounds improbable, but I started a coffee shop. And thought, okay, my daughters would work at the coffee shop, and my husband would maybe help out too if it grew, and I would have the house to myself. Well, of course, it didn't work out that way. <laughs> So I had been very busy in the time of the coming of the course and then right afterwards. And so um, I began to spend a lot of time afterwards in solitude. I had this little cabin out in the woods behind my yard. And I had two retreats with Jesus in which I did the 40 days with him. I had begun having conversations with Jesus or dialogues with Jesus shortly after A Course of Love ended. And they continued into that time. And there are two really big things that happened on these retreats. The first one was uh, Jesus was doing this guidance with me. And he told me, so I had this dream. You can no longer sell your mind for money. Your mind belongs to God. And I had turned that dream into I was to work for God. It was very, it might seem like a subtle difference, but, you know, I can remember, like, right afterwards when I had no, after I left my job and I had no idea what my work for God was going to be, I went to see my priests. You know, it's like, how do I know what my work for God is going to be? That seemed like one way to approach it. So, it was working for God. This thought was in my mind from very early after I had left my job. I was going to leave that job to work for God. So I have this retreat many years later, four or five years later, and Jesus tells me that that was a distortion. I was not called to work for God. I was called not to sell my mind for money. My mind belonged to God. And that might seem like a subtle difference, but it wasn't. It really, um, thinking that I was working for God had determined a lot of the way that I had proceeded with the Course. I was the worker bee. I was the person who had to do all the work. That was the way I thought of myself. Instead of as this beating heart that was in touch with the heartbeat of Christ consciousness, And suddenly, in that retreat, I began to realize that. And also, possibly, why one of the manifestations, one of the only physical manifestations that I had while I was receiving A Course of Love was this very, very hard beating of my heart that would cause me to rock. I would suddenly... You know, kind of, I'd be doing the receiving and not aware of anything, and suddenly I'd, I'd realize I was rocking like crazy and my heart was beating like crazy. And the funny thing is, now I'm doing all these Zoom calls, and sometimes I'll see myself like I'm still rocking. <laughs> so that was uh, 2005, and the next year, 2006, in a similar retreat, doing the 40 days with Jesus, we got to day 10. Now, in day 10, Jesus leaves us as the man Jesus and asks us to invite our own Christ consciousness into uh, being what speaks for us. 
And Jesus told me then, he says, I have to wean you from hearing my voice. Because if you keep hearing my voice, you're not going to hear the voice, the voice of your own Christ consciousness. And he said, you have to hear the Christ voice in everything and everyone. And right after that, I swear it was within minutes, I see a flash of color coming through my yard. And I go to my cabin door and look out, and it's Mary Love coming at that exact time. And before I can tell her anything, you know, we would always just start talking right away about whatever had happened. She says, oh, I, I saw this great interview, and it was this woman, I think Charlie Rose, maybe, and it was, it was this woman talking about how she'd read this book, and she saw this man's pace on, face on, on the back of it, and she said, he was Christ to me. That's the kind of connection Mary and I have shared. You know, things come to us at the same time. Outside of time and space and distance, we are connected heart to heart. And so I'd like to invite her up to tell you some of the, the way A Course of Love affected her. Mary? Well, my name is Oopsie. <laughs> I say Oopsie a lot. <laughs> um, okay. well, I was going to tease her. I said, yeah, Mary says Oopsie, and I say, oh. <laughs> well, I'm Mary Love, and I absolutely adore this woman. Um, she's so right in that all we have shared, even areas that seem to be disparate subjects and topics, when we come together, there it's almost, in fact, to give you a prime example, I had my talk ready for today. I listened to Mari because I was doing video, and half of what she said was my talk. So I, luckily I'd come armed with two talks, one semi-funny at how ridiculous I truly am spiritually. That hasn't ended. And then something after hearing John and Mari, I realized I had to do something, and that was the other talk that I'm going to share with you. I want to set the scene, though, about how we got here, just here from Philadelphia. We were scheduled at a B&B that was 88 degrees, stifling, and that was with the air on. And we both are private. We, I knew we would need space, you know, to prepare and do what we needed to do. And so we quickly, Mari found a suite at Holiday Inn. So last night, after everything, the dinners and everything, we, I worked with Mari at the university. We crisscrossed the United States doing conventions for uh, the program that we were in, a graduate health care program. So we knew how to get things done. I know her style. She knows mine. So Mari said, I said, this is kind of what I'm going to do. You've, you've already talked about what I was going to talk about, but we'll, we'll start over. And so Mari said, well, I'm going to just practice moving, <laughs> moving my lips. You won't hear anything, but I'll be in the other room practicing my talk. Well, I'm real kinetic. So I heard this kind of mumbling. And what I do when I'm in preparation is I walk. I walk, I have my papers, I'm moving. I told Mari, oops, I told Mari today if I had a horse, I would be on it galloping down the road to work through what I needed to say. And my fear, my fear right now is I, when I began writing this talk, was that I was breaking all the rules. And when I began to type what I'm going to tell you, I felt this quivering above the keys of my computer. 
And so I hope you'll just be with me right now that we can join. And I might not say things the right way. I'm going to try. I don't mean to offend anyone. John, I don't mean to offend you, Mari, nor you. But I'm speaking from my heart in the words that I know. So I, I'll just throw these away. <laughs> As you know, Mari and I have known each other for 25 years. And when I began to work at the university, I was newly married. And within six months, I was pregnant. Mari was there, and another friend of ours, Julianne Carver, who also was pregnant within three days. Our due dates were three days apart. And I was really enjoying, I was full of excitement and joy at this, you know, I married a great man, I waited to have a child, I was doing it all right, I thought. And then the dreams began. And I want to tell you, when I use the word dream, what I'm really talking about is stepping out of time. It wasn't in waking consciousness that this happened. There were dreams at night, but they began to speak with me. And I hope, I hope that you might see some type of progression with four or five dreams that I had. So just bear with me. If I fumble a bit, I'm an amateur. And if I'm an amateur, and it comes from the Latin word amor, to love. So that's all I can give you now is love. And I, I'm, I fumble quite a bit, just naturally, not in front of people. So the first dream that I had was I saw a beautiful little baby with golden hair. I saw all her color. It was just like a photograph of her face. And then the photograph moved further and further and further away. Within a month, I was having a routine checkup, and the doctor told me something was wrong, that my child had an enlarged heart. I was put in a room with a box of Kleenex and a telephone, and I ca I'm sorry. I called my husband but couldn't reach him at work. And so I called Mari. I don't remember. I know I'm shaking. I don't remember what I said, but I know that Mari's love was holding me up. My daughter Grace lived for five weeks. She had seven surgery to surgeries. She had what they call an AV malformation. The hospital, the physicians tried everything, everything they could do, including a rush order going down to the Mayo Clinic to get these tiny rods because blood was being shunted to her heart like a river. And they were trying to block the flow and fish these little tiny, tiny rods through her baby, baby infant veins. The day that Grace died, in the morning, I had another dream in which I hovered above the earth, and what I saw was complete and utter beauty. There is no human word, I will tell you, for ecstasy. No word, human word, that comes close. But this is the only way I can share this. The light there was something I had never seen. There was a hum, a kind of noise, and music that contained information. And in this information, I knew via the sound and light that everything was perfect. That there was never a mistake, ever. And that was the day Grace died. I returned to work. I, I should add to that morning and other mornings, I kept waking up 
with four half moons on my palms. And I realized that I was sleeping like this, digging my nails into my palms, even in a, a place of rest. I returned to work. Now, I want you to remember this date. I returned to work after Grace's funeral service, and the service was on September 3rd, 1994. I was numb bewildered and completely confused. I felt I could not blame God, but I could blame myself. And that was the position that I was standing by in that moment. You'll hear why later. I shyly, when I went back to work, began to share these dreams with Mari and our friend Julie and then they began to dream and everything opened up it was one miracle after the other and we all we, we had what we called dream updates so we would go on break and our office happened to be right by Mortuary Sciences at the university. So we sit, sat in these windowsills outside of this stone building with, that was built in 1928. And we would share what was happening in our internal worlds. And it was lovely. And all I knew was that I needed to be close to these women. I needed them in my life. In that, I, oh, I'm going ahead, sorry. But I also knew, at the point that I start, started sharing so deeply, that I had closed a part of myself off. This was not done willingly, but it was done. It occurred. I wrote in secret in Grace's baby journal. For me, it was inconceivable that I had this baby and then she was gone. It, it didn't, my, my thinking mind couldn't catch up with this fact at all. It, it wasn't penetrating. But I continued to write to her telling her stories of the family, and then the dreams, and my, my love for um, Mari and Julie, and, and how my heart on a certain level was opening up, but fear still was a part of me. So Mari, being Mari, we would share what we were reading. She said, you can't believe it, I've got this book. It's called A Course in Miracles. So she promptly went out and bought 20 copies for her closest friends and family. And I was a recipient of one of the copies. And here's what I did. You know Minnesota's cold. We get a lot of snow. Every night, I would build a fire during the winter in our living room. I turned off all the lights. I lit candles. And I had a little book light and I'd put it on A Course in Miracles. I always have a highlighter, and I would begin to highlight. I am telling you one thing. A person never, ever knows when love, when you will open to love, and love will come to you. It, it just happens. But one such night, I read the words in A Course of Miracles. You come here to heal. And it was like I heard the word heal in a new way. I, I, I had actually never known what healing was until that moment. I interpreted this to mean, in this time, you do not have to wait. It is here. I grabbed onto it so fast. I put the book down. I was stunned. I cried. And these were tears of relief, of hope. And I felt as if I could lay my body down. I was so tired. I could rest, simply rest, and so I did. 
I am going to go on now to tell you other stories about my hiddenness and I will lay myself down for you today so you understand my heart. Mari left the university. I was completely lost. She was... um, I don't have human words for even Mari, except that she meant everything to me, and our connection was so deep and strong. Well, I had taken to having coffee with her when I could, if I brought work home and got it done. And so I would, at least once a week, stop by her house and we would share. Then in 1997, as you know, another dream came where I saw a stack of books that came in rapid fashion, stacked like this. And during our coffee talk, I shared this with Mari. To me, it was a dream. I said, in the dream, I heard, it, there's a new Course in Miracles. And so, for me, it was a dream. But Mari's eyes got really large. I didn't know why. I just thought she liked the dream. She loved A Course in Miracles. But what had really happened was this was a, my dream, but her message. It was a message for her. And I will tell you one thing with this woman. This is how we have operated since day one. Words unspoken. We deliver to each other no matter what, no matter what time of day. So, I want to add that we don't do anything ever alone, ever. It is always in union that we understand and know love. Even if you're not speaking to a person, at times such as Mari and I, the messages are being received, the love is going there, and we had the good fortune to be close enough to one another to be able to share this. Now, I want to fast forward 18 years. By this time, I had felt with the Course in Miracles and other spiritual paths that I was on that I would, had healed. I had really, I was functional and working. I seemed somewhat happy. Well, really quite happy. And that made me happy to be happy. And then one night, I had this feeling of being like a cat on a hot tin roof, if you know the feeling. I was very nervous. I had this sparky energy. I was in bed. I got up. It was 2016. I walked across from my bedroom to what I call my creative space. And I picked up A Course of Love, the combined version by her publications, Take Heart, which I love. I love the combined version, but I had never read any of it. I opened it up and I read two paragraphs. I closed the book, I went back to bed, I got on Amazon, bought it on my Kindle app, and I began to read. As I mentioned, I thought I was done healing, but something was emerging in me that needed a voice. My heart at this point, Mari mentioned this as well, but my heart began pounding like a drum. I finished A Course of Love in three months. That's all the books. What was revealed to me was this. Jesus stated that there was no fear. My heart was pounding like mad, like crazy. He asked for acceptance. My heart went wild. I realized on a certain level that something was hidden within me that needed expression. If I wanted to love, truly love, I had to 
accept this hidden part of me and bring it into the light. I, if I, if something is truly hidden, this is what I found. I had no awareness of some of the things that I'm about to tell you. Okay, so if I have awareness of them, I will share them. I had no problem sharing, but I had no awareness of some of the things that I'll tell you about. In hiddenness and wholeness, if what is hidden is not brought to light, you have tremendous fear, you have tremendous doubt, and I can tell you one thing, I, I call it, I went subterranean. That's what happened. Everything went underground. I don't know if anyone else has had those feelings, but it happened to me. Six weeks into A Course of Love, I had another dream. So this isn't that long ago. In which I saw a man in a chair with a crown of lights, Christmas tree, tiny Christmas tree lights, like the crown of thorns, but they were Christmas tree lights. On the wall over there, there were two men and a big lever. And I knew if the lever was pulled down, the man would die. The lights would come on and he would die. And I began to laugh because I do this when I'm spiritually inept, I think. And all of a sudden in the dream, I'm in the chair with the lights on my head and those darn men pulled the lever on me. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you the question, did I die? And I'm going to tell you, yes, I did. I died. I died a seven-month death. Everything that had been hidden within me began to emerge. Things I didn't understand. And I hope you can bear with me as I tell you this. One by one, my, my fears began to speak to me. I know I'm saying this wrong in the course land, but these were my hidden fears. Number one. At 11 months of age, my brother was extremely ill. For the next seven to eight years, he was sick. Not through lack of love from my parents, but because of circumstance, I felt this was normal. I had really very limited memory of my mother but I did my father. And I couldn't figure out why I remembered my dad and not my mother. Well, the reason why was my mother wasn't, she was there, but she wasn't with me. She was with my brother. About five years ago, my mother told me, before I had this dream, she said, Mary, I'm so sorry I wasn't around you. And I said, Mom, you were, are you crazy? You know, you were there. And she said, no. She shook her head. No, I wasn't there. The lesson I learned at that young age was my life was up to me. Only I could care for myself and to keep a very, very low profile. Number two, when I was in college, I lived in a studio apartment, ground level. I'd been out with a girlfriend. She dropped me off. It was a Friday night. I always read before I go to sleep. And all of a sudden, I see in my bedroom doorway a silhouette of a man. Before I knew it, this man was on top of me, and he had cocked my head to the side and covered my face. What I didn't realize is he, at that, that moment, he had put a knife to my neck. And he said, be quiet, and I won't hurt you. 
Well, I didn't have a lot going for me then. So I asked him, implored him. I said, do you promise? He didn't say anything. I said at least 200 times, do you promise? Do you promise me? Do you promise? Do you promise? Do you promise me? I don't know how long this went on, but I could feel he was getting a bit agitated. So I, I said, okay, I'll be, I won't ask you this anymore. I could tell by his muscles and everything. And then he got up and he said, okay. Well, I didn't, I, he said, I want you to wait in bed for 30 minutes. I never heard him leave. So I had to make a decision. And the decision I made was, I had already seen my mother at my funeral. I knew she would blame herself. But I decided I couldn't wait like a, a sitting duck in bed, that if I died, which there was a possibility, I would face my killer. And if I saw his face, that would be enough for me at that moment in time. I got up and I looked around my apartment and the door was open. I hadn't heard him leave. All the cupboard doors were open, bathroom, medicine cabinet. I called a friend of mine that lived nearby. She called the police. The police came and they said, were you hurt? And I said, no, I wasn't hurt. Were you raped? No, I wasn't raped. And the police said, well, what about this? I had longer hair then. My neck was all bloody from being held in that position. Lesson learned, only I could protect myself. It was all up to me. I could not lean on others because they might not be there. Example number three. I had a daughter, you know Grace, that died, but I had not been at her bedside. Because my husband really wanted me to rest, I had let Grace down. I faulted myself for not knowing, knowing this. The lesson I learned then was that I must be aware and be able to anticipate anything that might happen to me. In all fairness, though, A Course in Miracles had carried me through a lot, but it was this last piece of not being with my daughter that I judged myself about. This was the seventh, seventh month death that I experienced. One by one, these fears were brought to light because of a course of love. It was unbelievable. The surge of energy, in fact, Janet in front here told me when she saw me today, she's been to my house, she said, you look so different. And I do, I look so different. I mean, I can't believe the energy I have. Everything has changed about me. I want to close with one more dream, which was a week ago. And this ties into something John spoke of yesterday. A week ago, I saw, I had a dream in which I saw a luminous white light in the background. It was pulsating like this. And I saw an open book with writing. I was being instructed to know that these were holy words in the book. And I would stumble, kind of stumble through them. And then I was taken back to, to repeat the holy words again. Three times this happened. Finally, when I got it, the holy words came up off the page into smoke like this and moved into the atmosphere. I knew then that these words were living. They were alive. I saw one word 
I should tell you. In this instruction, John, it was told to me that all holy words have a numeric value. Then I saw the word grace, and I saw 722, which was the date of my daughter's birthday. Then, you, what you don't know, John, behind the scenes, when you were talking, Mari was, oops, Mari was sitting where you are, and the minute she heard you bring up the story of the scrolls and everything and the numeric values, Mari, I was doing video over there, she started looking at me. Mary, I had shared this story in a dialogue group before I came. When I heard John speak of this, there was no mistake why I was here. It gave me so much, so much courage to tell this story. And I was so worried, John, that if I use the word dream, you would think I was funny or something, but it really is stepping out of time for me. I want to close now with more holy words. Come up with me. And this is from A Course of Love. A forgiven world is whole, and it, in its wholeness, one with you. It is here in wholeness that peace abides and heaven is. It is from wholeness that heaven awaits, that heaven waits for you. Think of this now. How could heaven be a separate place? I came to tell you today that I am free. I may have other challenges. And I'm so happy that you can hear my story. I hope you heard my heart. And John, thank you for helping me to tell this. You gave me courage, too, with your story. So, and of course, always, <laughs> I've got this one right here beside me. So I just want to say amen, amen, thank you. And thank you for the love you've shown me. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> Now, if you have questions, hang on to them. We're going to bring up John and uh, let him share a little bit. Remember, here at the center, we encourage grazing, so if you'd like to go over and fill anything up, feel free to do it while we're here. So, John, do you want to come on up? Afternoon. I think actually I want to come around here. Is that okay? Yeah. And sort of, uh, I can, if I need to, just a little bit. This is a strong enough table. Yeah, is it because I'm standing? I was working there for a second. But it's, going, it's going on and off, so we don't want to... It's going on and off. All right. Just turn it off. Actually, this is the way things work. I'm not kidding about that. I wrote an article in Miracles Magazine. And by the way, real quick announcement. If you'd like to subscribe, you can get it for half price if you do it today. Now, that's done. <laughs> Actually, we are opening Miracles Magazine to uh, articles uh, on A Course of Love, so it's sort of, see, that's, that's a duel right there, right? We've got two possibilities, and there's more than two possibilities. There's a section in A Course in Miracles which talks about the attraction of guilt and the attraction of God. These are like two major 
holds that we have in life. And the Course in Miracles says that all there is is one mind. There's really only one experience. And that experience, as we have just seen and heard, the universal experience is an experience of love. And insofar as we know what that's about, we know that that is uh, a deeply fulfilling experience for us. But I wasn't kidding about the off-on part, because <clears throat> how do computers work? They work with zeros and ones, right? So everything is off, on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, on, right? The thing is to get it, to get the flow going, to get the balance going, to get back to, to oneness. Our friend Mark Greenberg says this happens so fast, it happens billions of times a second. I can't even imagine billions of times a second. But it has to work at that speed in order for us, in order for information to be conveyed, right? So here we are. What we're doing here is we're learning about these two wonderful books which convey a message for us. The message is a very simple message. I'm here, I love you, you're a part of the love. Just all you gotta do is remember me, you know, come back home again, don't wander off into this illusion, don't get caught up in this dream. That's the attraction of guilt. The attraction of guilt is literally an attraction. It, it pulls us into the body, it pulls us into anger, it pulls us into attack, it pulls us into overeating, it pulls us into addictions, and you can't help but feel guilty when you go that way. The, the whole course is, in miracles now, is really about guilt. It's about overcoming guilt. It's getting beyond the guilt. I love it that it's the center for uh, mystical studies that has brought us all together because mysticism is this other, is this attraction for God. It's the pull, it's the pull of God. And we're constantly also being pulled. So a mystic is really in that some, some sense, the, the, someone who is being seduced by the love of God. I mean, they're literally being pulled, constantly pulled into it, so that they're, they're giving up on this other kind of addiction, the, the separated addiction. It's a funny thing, we, were, we had a meeting this morning for brunch, a group of us who are talking about, and it was wonderful that Glenn made this possible for us to be able to sit and talk in an informal kind of way. People are talking about the differences between a course in miracles and a course in love. And I've been studying both of them now, having spent most of my life studying most of my life, yeah, 43 years studying A Course in Miracles. And the more I study The Course of Love, the more I realize that there aren't any real differences because there aren't any real differences between us because there's no, love is one, God is one. We are quite literally of one mind, yet it appears as though we are separate. So that's the off-on. The off-on is that there's a relationship between the two of us, right? If there wasn't the relationship, and as I said yesterday, there's a line from the Course where it says, divine abstraction is another name for God takes joy in sharing. So it's the sharing that really matters and it really makes this whole experience worthwhile. But we have to learn. Yesterday, I talked a little bit about the the way that the ego uses the body, and I referred to it as an app, and if you were here, you remember, I won't go into it, but just to review quickly, the Course says the, the ego uses the body for attack, for pleasure, and for pride. I didn't talk about how the Holy Spirit uses the body, and three people have asked me, please talk about how the Holy Spirit Let's, let's have the other side of this thing as well. So let me do that in answer to the people who ask that I answer that question. So the way the Holy Spirit uses us is that 
And there's no acronym for this. Like there's an acronym for app. We don't have an acronym, but the initials are L C F H. Okay? So just a this way to, to remember what I'm talking about here. We're here to learn. The, the course is the body is a learning mechanism. This is a tool for learning. Right? So if this is a tool for learning, then I want to keep this tool working. Well, my father was a tool man. <laughs> By a tool man, I meant the tools were always clean and they were always put in their place. They were hung, hung up and no shovel was used that didn't get washed and oiled before it was put back in shape. There's another tool man, Dr. Rod Selberg, sitting there who understands what I'm talking about. But the body is a tool. So it's, it's how we take care of the tool that helps in a great deal in terms of beginning. If we are, we're all like radios is another way that we could talk about it. So these ladies, Mari and other, have become receptors. And they're very good at receiving information which we can now share in a very loving kind of way. Well, we all are. It's just that they've learned how to tune in in a very specific way to get all this information that was true for for Helen as well. Helen knew how to shut down the ego function, although it was still a very active part of her life, but she could shut it off, like a radio. She could shut it off and then begin to hear God's voice speaking through her, uh, as Lesson 49 says, all through the day, quite literally all through the day. So we're learning how to listen, and we have these wonderful books which contain these words that gives us a clues on how to do it. So we need things like A Course in Miracles because it is a yana yoga, it is of the mind, it is showing us, so we begin to put the pieces together, we begin to have aha experiences ourselves, and those aha experiences are teaching us how to live, but something you need to be repeated. Oh, you know, the Course keeps saying the same thing, oh well, of course, so does A Course of Love. You know, it just keeps saying the same thing over and over and over again because we're very dense. I mean, it's, it really takes a lot for us to be able to begin to, to get this in, but we do get it. And the way that we get it very often, it's through, as Mary was saying, it's really through an experience. It's the experience of God. Of course, in Miracles says, we, someone said yesterday, a universal theology is impossible, but a universal experience, that's what we call mysticism, <laughs> a universal experience is not only possible but necessary. So we need to have, but we, in order to have that experience, we have to make ourselves available to the experience. So this is a learning device. Whatever we're doing, whether it's reading or whatever it is that we're doing, to, to learn. L-C-H, and the, the C is communication. That's what we're doing right now. We're communi why, do we, why do we have conferences? Why do we have workshops? Why do we call everybody together to sit? We, we talk, we read, we communicate. This is the communication medium. The Holy Spirit communicates with us. doesn't always work in terms of words, but it works in terms of experience, which opens the heart. Your experience is a profound opening of the heart. Actually, we know, because the statistics studies have been done, to show how people come to have mystical experiences. And actually, more people wake up to crash and burn experiences than in any other way. I mean, you would, it'd be nice if we could just have an opening, but it doesn't happen exactly that way. There's something that has to happen that some tragedy, unfortunately, that really makes us stop. You've got to get to stop. That's the most important thing. Because the ego is always chattering and always going on. It's just running the show all the time and it never stops. You've got to... I read an article. One of the books back there is called uh, A Course in Miracles and dot, dot, dot. It's an anthology of articles which were originally in Miracles magazine. I only wrote the introduction and the chapter on Zen Buddhism. And the reason I wrote the chapter on Zen, and by the way, I had a Zen Buddhist proof the chapter before I printed it, <laughs> to be 100% sure that I had this right, 
What you have to do is you got to get back to stop. I mean, th that's one of the reasons for meditation. We've got to get back to the point of stopping the mind, stopping the insanity, stopping the projection before you can see. You cannot be a projector and a receptor at the same time. We're learning how to become receptors to the voice of the Holy Spirit so that we can hear that as a guide through life rather than allowing this insane ego to be the primary guide that so much of the world follows and that we have followed ourselves. But we know that that doesn't work because the ego always runs into a ditch. By that I mean, by the way, don't be afraid of egos in the sense that this is an important point. All egos always implode. They're, they have a built-in destruct mechanism. And it may take a while for that mechanism to, 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 to destruct, but it will. All dictators fail. <laughs> it always happens. They always come to tragic ends. Sometimes they make terrible messes before it gets to that point, but it will get to that point, right? But we can get to that point of just stopping the mind and becoming receptive to the guidance of God very simply by studying, by listening. And so LC, communication. Communication is what's important. If a couple want to heal a relationship, they have to have communication going on, right? They have to be able to talk to each other to get back to where we're going with this. So it's the communication that becomes the important thing. But eventually, again, we're going to be transcending words. Because eventually, as we talked about, words don't, words actually in the long run, of course, as God does not understand words, right? Because it's not a communi God's communication with us doesn't happen with, sometimes it seems to get reduced down to words. But it doesn't have to be that way because real communication, as the Course of Love is telling us, is happening with the level of the heart, right? And the heart doesn't have words. I look at my wife and I say, I love you. And I think, that is so inadequate. <laughs> you know, okay, I love you a lot. <laughs> okay, I love you very much. It's not working. <laughs> I write a poem, that's a little bit better. <laughs> Still not it. <laughs> better, but you know, not not that, not, not all the way there yet, and because it transcends all that. It becomes a feeling which it's, I mean, I, I left a little note on the mirror in the bathroom before I left to come here for the weekend, and all it said was, I love you more every day, and out there, right? Which is true! <laughs> you know, it's just, if you keep falling, you keep falling in love. But the, what happens with the mystic, the mystic keeps falling in love with God. And you can't help fall in love with God but falling in love with everybody. <laughs> because how are you going to love God if you can't love each other, right? It's, it's, and it's and not just that, but, but in, in, in seeing the love in the people that we have trouble with, that's a particularly important el element, right? And you can do that, too. So, L, C, communication is the way we do this. F, forgiveness is the process by which this is done. And forgiveness is really very simple. It just means you don't, you let it go. <laughs> it's a, how, how simple can you put, let it go? You know, whatever you think that you, you think this is important? You think it's important that you have this anger, that you have attack thoughts? You, you think it, it, hate is the right kind of a, a thing? I was talking to somebody recently, and she just was talking about somebody else, and she, she was just so rude. She was so rude to me. <laughs> That's really interesting. Why are, you, why are you into the rude part? You know, watch the words, right? Projection makes perception. And she was getting caught in the fact her ego was caught in somebody being rude. Well, forget about it. <laughs> the sooner you can let that go, the better. There's no reason to get plugged into the fact that somebody was rude. It doesn't make any difference. People are rude. Big deal. Let it go. <laughs> yeah. Yes, why should it become my problem? That's the whole thing. Don't make anything, don't make a problem, your problem, something that's exterior. So, L, C, F, 
H. H is healing. This is all about healing. It's all about healing the mind. It's all about healing the heart. It's all about coming back home to God once again. So one of the things that I wanted to also work in briefly this morning, as we were talking uh, this morning of breakfast, um, I said to Glenn, it's a conundrum. <laughs> By a conundrum, I mean when we get into the deeper levels of understanding the metaphysics of the course, both courses, you know, we get to the point where it looks like that there are contradictions, but beyond the contradiction, there really isn't any kind of contradiction. When love prevails, it doesn't make any difference that there are differences. We sort of talked about that briefly yesterday. So I found this book laying on that back table back there that somebody wrote <laughs> that um, I thought it had some interesting lines and in maybe I would share some of these. So this is what, but this is what happens in mysticism, really. These are just some suggestions of what the mystical experiences are out. Um, what can never be lost can't be found. Mystics use the mind to go beyond the mind. God is the darkness behind the light. God is not material, but is visible in everything. Mysticism is the undoing or the undoing of doing. You must close your eyes in order to see. Matter does not matter. While consciousness is something and nothing, being is being without being. <laughs> Mysticism is the static as well as the dynamic, the stillness as dancing. The passivity at which mystic aims is a state of intense activity. <laughs> of myself I can do nothing is to say, this is from A Course in Miracles, to say of myself I can do nothing is to gain all power. To lose oneself is to find oneself. What you are seeking is seeking you. The best way to get somewhere is to let go of the need to be anywhere. <laughs> Mystic enjoy true liberty in, in proportion to the things they can leave alone. <laughs> or what do you lose when you lose an illusion? So all of these are just like the paradoxes of this, uh, of this experience we call life. But love transcends all paradoxes, right? We just know. The Course talks about the difference between perception and knowledge. But it's really hard to talk about knowledge. I mean, it's really hard to talk about what knowledge is. One of the basic characteristics of a mystical experience is called the noetic quality. And another basic characteristic is ineffability. So we have this knowledge we know, but trying to put this into words is very difficult but we can talk about it as an experience. So I'm going to tell you about a couple of experiences uh, and then I just want to be sure my time. I, I got six minutes. Okay. <laughs> I want to tell you about a couple of experiences that not that I had but that um, some people have told me about their mystical experiences. Where the Course is going, where all of this is going, of course, is back to home to God again, which we understand God is one, God is whole, God is complete, and you are a part of this oneness, this wholeness. And whenever we have an experience of feeling a part of this oneness, whether it's in nature, whether it's with music, whether it's falling out, when you fall in love, you become one with the beloved, right? You want to just do things, you want to give to the beloved. We said that yesterday. Okay, so I was giving a lecture on mysticism in uh, Arcadia, California a few years ago and somebody walked up to me after I'd given the talk and he said, you know, I play in the Hollywood Symphony Orchestra. And he says, there's this most wonderful thing that can happen when you're playing in a symphony orchestra. Anybody play in an orchestra ever? He says, what happens is, when it's working perfectly, 
and you know it's working perfectly. You know every everyone there is on note and in tune. You know that everyone knows that every other musician is on note and in tune. You know that the audience knows. You know that the conductor knows. He says you get these goosebumps that go over your entire body. And he says you know, you just know. Without, There's no question about this. You're about to have this experience that's called a standing ovation. Right? <laughs> so I told that story at a uh, another talk about what mysticism is. It's that kind of that experience of oneness. And a woman came up to me afterwards and she said, I had the same experience. He said, she said, except I was leading a dance troupe. And we were dancing on stage and she says, I don't know what it was about that night, but it was perfect. Every dancer was exactly where they were supposed to be at exactly the time that they were supposed to be. Everyone on point. Everyone was on point, right? She said the orchestra, they were perfect. It was just all working out. And she knew that this, this was perfect. She said, we get to the end of the piece and the dancers are not on mic. And they all have to stop in a certain kind of position, right? And she says, when they stopped, one of the dancers said, but only so the other dancers could hear, they, they were kind of turned away from the audience. Did you feel that? <laughs> Did you feel that? <laughs> it's a feeling, right? But it's a feeling that we know that connects us with the whole. And that's where all of this is going. Right. And that's being home again. That's being back with God again. That's being complete. And when you get a poem, <laughs> when something works perfectly well, that's the way it's supposed to be. And it can work that way all the time. If we can just get out of it. Aldo Sexley once said, if you could get out of your not self's light, you could be illumined. If you could stop anxiously cogitoing, you could give yourself a chance to be cogitoed. In other words, if you could stop anxiously thinking, you could give yourself a chance to be thought. Okay, so just to be thought, just to hear this. Well, Helen Schuckman had a way of getting out of her way. Maurice had a way of getting out of her way. And there are other ways, as I mentioned yesterday, Richard Allcamp is here on the back row. Today he is here, <laughs> gave me this book called From the Christ Mind. That's another way, you just hear it. It becomes so clear and, it, and so thank God that, it's, that uh, it's given to these one, and then they share it. And because we share it and we read it, and we say this is, yeah, this is true, this has got to be true. Right? So you read the course, either one of the courses, and you think this is true. And, this, and, then, and then you fall in love with the word it's the word that, that brings us to the light. My time is actually up. Uh, Joe, did you want to go straight to questions? Is that what you want to do? Oh. John, but we do ask that you would use the microphone. Ken here has the microphone, so if you have a question, raise your hand and Ken will give you a microphone. So we'll open it for questions now for anybody for our wonderful presentation. Okay, is there a question here? Oh, I thought I saw it. All right. Okay. Everyone understands it. That's great. <laughs> it's, it's that clear, right? <laughs> It is, actually. And we can also, as been kind of the theme of our, our time together, talk about the, the complementarity and the ways the courses work together. 
I think we, we've seen a lot of that even today. Stories we've heard that were shared and the way John puts it in such perspective and how it all comes back to the feeling. You were talking about the symphony, how it at a certain point it's just perfect. And Mary said that at one point it's like everything is perfect. And so even from different perspectives, you see, you, you get that mystical moment. So uh, I think we have a question uh, back here. Uh, Reza, go ahead. Yeah, peace and blessings. So my question is, I'm wondering um, about uh, both of you, sort of the... I'm curious about the rhythm of your studying this work that you've downloaded, both of you, and, and especially you, John, having had a long period of time to both study and teach. So I'm curious as to, uh, uh, I guess the big question is, what are the passages that really are moving you now? Like, what are you studying in each of these works um, that um, has your heart or has your curiosity or that you're grappling with? And the, and the other question is around cycles. Do you find that you read certain things at a certain point? Have you noticed any cycles in the way you study the work? Huh? Well, um, first of all, I, I had the good fortune of being a minister for a very long time, still am, but not in the formal context of a church as we talked about last night. And it's a wonderful job from the standpoint of, is our pastor still here? Yeah, it's a wonderful job in the sense that I can't see you very well, so I'm moving over here. There we go, thank you. <laughs> You're put into this position where you have to sit down once a week and put your thoughts together in a meaningful way that you can hopefully communicate to other people and they will understand it and get some inspiration from it. What a job! You're forced into this kind of situation. And, of course, the things that I like to work on were the things, either the pe problems that people were bringing me, or that there's always something cooking. Uh, it's, writing is a, an alchemical process. It's a cooking. You bring pieces in, you mix it together, you take stuff out, that's called editing. <laughs> you, you throw more in, you stir it around a little bit, you keep doing that whole process. But the good part about it is that it never ends. And and it never ends for you either. I mean, everybody is, is cooking. I mean, we're cooking, we're working on ideas all the time. And, and we're sharing them. And hopefully you're getting somewhere. We have the great privilege of being able to try to put these things into a meaningful context. Uh, actually, the, the way the Miracles magazine got started real quickly, I'll share this and then get married to Miracles Magazine got started when I was uh, a member of my church some 33 years ago, was moving. And he came to me and he said, I know that you write out your sermons. I don't read them, but I would write them out in detail. And he said, if I gave you a dollar a week, would you be willing to to make a Xerox of that and put a stamp on an envelope and mail it to me? And I said, sure, I can do that, if you don't mind some of the errors. <laughs> and and I, well, I could do that. I could send one to my mom and to my sister. And da, 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 da. Now, if anybody else wants to do it, they're going to have to give me a dollar a week as well. <laughs> well, that, it, that's literally, it just kept growing. I started adding poetry and seasonal activities and stuff that was going on but it's a wonderful you know we're always we're all we're all always cooking we just have the privilege and I like I don't know about Mari but early in the morning is really the best time really early before our daughter we go to school I mean really the, the first couple of hours of the day before the phone begins to ring that's read a little bit of the Course in Miracles, and then, and I don't have to go to any particular. I just whatever I'm working on, then I go to the index and find out what the Course says about that. Or now I'm going to the index of a Course of Love as well. Mari. <laughs> um, 
I realize I was so um, excited to have my friend Mary join me and speak that I didn't share with you the reading between 19 and 20 that and I did, if, you're, if you can stand it I'd like to do that because I finished chapter 19 and then you can't go on with your thinking mind and the, this is kind of the way to me these, these passages work is something happens you don't realize it and then a year later you realize it you know it's sort of like I well I'm going to uh, share just real briefly because these are beautiful passages in two different ways so chapter 19 is sort of like an ending chapter it's called oneness and duality this chapter is included in it out of the deepest darkest chaos of your mind comes the possibility of light it is a bit like traveling backward or the review of life that some experience after death. In order to remember unity, you must, in a sense, travel back to it, undoing as you go all you have learned since last you knew it, so all that remains is love. This undoing or atonement has begun and once begun is unstoppable and thus inevitably inevitably accomplished <laughs> I say words wrong all the time you don't realize it until you start doing an audio book and it's like when your publisher says uh, it's not Harbringer it's like, or whatever it is you know there's things like that but this I mean I think that is an incredibly incredibly powerful paragraph out of the deepest darkest chaos of your mind comes the possibility of light but I would receive this thing and then it would sort of come into me and be gone so I sit down then to get the next words from Jesus I'm not remembering what I got before so imagine my surprise when after 10 weeks of hearing you can't go on with your thinking mind, what follows but the chapter on the embrace, which is everybody's favorite chapter. So it's like you get, I believe you get these messages, like, you know, this out of the deepest, darkest chaos, and it does something to you. Somehow that passage led me to this place of I couldn't go on with my thinking mind and then what follows is the heart is the heart speaking the embrace your longing now has reached a fever pitch a burning in your heart quite different than that which you have helped before your heart may even feel as if it is stretching outward straining heavenward near to bursting with its desire for union a desire you do not understand but can surely feel I could go on and on this is such a beautiful chapter but it's that whole now now we've fallen into the embrace and so I meant to kind of tie that together that think, letting go of the thinking mind and then you're going to experience more and more fully that presence of the heart. Yes, you're going to feel that embrace. And like John was saying, it's like you don't know what these feelings are often. And you try to bring them out. You try to express them. But they're sort of unknown until they become known. You know, maybe a year later. <laughs> so... Uh, John, you had mentioned that one of the Holy Spirit apps was stop. And, and Maury, if I recall correctly, you were being told to stop thinking. And I'm wondering if both of you could tell us whether meditation is one way to help 
stop. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Well, in the simplest form, yes, that's always true, right? In Buddhism, the idea is to get back to non-conceptualization, back to a zero point, actually to, to, the, to the point that there's, that there's no thought at all. Because it's not till we cl kind of clean house, that's the purification process of the Course in Miracles is talking about. It's not till we get all the junk out of there that we can begin to build back to become, to having the right information come our way. But you cannot be projective and receptive at the same time. I said that a moment ago, right? So, it, but there's other ways too. I mean, sometimes you come to stop without inten intending to come to stop. Or, or, and, and there's sometimes that you can meditate without intending to meditate. I had a friend, Dr. John Lilly, he called driving the American mode of meditation. Now, <laughs> it could also be the American mode of ego obsession. It's just depending on which mind that you're willing to entertain at the time, but actually you can drive a car and meditate at the same time. You just have to be very aware of your surroundings. That's, <laughs> that's the same thing. If you're very aware of your surroundings, that's, that's all it really is what it called for. Of course you want to go. But crashing and burning also causes you to stop. When you get down, I mean, that that's an absolute stop. All right. Can you address this? I just had one thought, and I probably can't express it real well, but I believe one of the really new things and really revolutionary things about um, A Course of Love, at least the way it tells us, you know, it's like, I think... Some of it, at least I know I took A Course in Miracles in like I was receiving manna from heaven, you know, and just couldn't stop reading it. But I think when you, it, talk, it does talk a lot about study and this and that, and A Course in Miracles. And A Course of Love goes in the reverse direction. It says, don't do that. Don't use your mind. Don't study. And there's been some recent um, scientific studies. They started, there's a, uh, and I'm not, I have a horrible memory, which is, uh, anyway, but this, was, I was reading about this in a book on centering prayer, because I'm a, cent that's a, a centering prayer, I'm a centering prayer practitioner, and so they've been studying, like, the Buddhists and people who do other, and sort of intentional um, meditations, and have only begun to study those who do centering prayer, which is more a meditation of the heart, and it's not an intentional meditation. And if I can express this somewhat correctly, and I think I have somebody here who might know, um, it was talking about how the intentional, it fires those parts of the brain that are still based on survival. But the unintentional goes draws on the hippocampus, is that correct? Okay, and so it's that deeper, deeper place of a more original knowing and a, a deeper sense of identity. And so I think the movement away from, um, you know, the thinking and the learning kind of goes together with the awakening of a deeper creative state, mystical states and that kind of thing. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, John, I know you, like myself, I'm a, I'm a student of Carl Jung, and we think of the collective consciousness. Uh, the beauty of ACOL and ACIM is how much we can get in touch with our own awakening process on an individual level, as Mary so well demonstrated today in her own uh, journey. Uh, when we look at the collective, and the world, you know, we can go back to when Socrates was in Athens and, and what he did to awaken consciousness on a collective level. And we can look at history and, and how a lot of uh, philosophers would say that consciousness is like a going up a down escalator. It can, you can go up faster and, and the collective consciousness can increase even more so that collectively we are more awakened. And then also it, it can go backwards to where consciousness goes in reverse place 
where we get more into the ego. So in this spectrum of the spirit thought system and the ego thought system as an example of collective consciousness, do you have opinions as to, given the world state as we see it today, <laughs> and, and, and the world that we've seen in our, in our own knowledges of history, uh, where we may or may not be, given that all minds are joined and the contagiousness of thought uh, that we experience all the time, and, and what your own opinions are around the consciousness of light versus dark, and what's happening in that world today and where it's going. That's a lot of questions. <laughs> you want to do it? I can do a little bit. You do a little then, bit. Yeah. Uh, what came to me right away when, you know, talking about the state of the world today is uh, where Jesus talks in A Course of Love about... Um, <laughs> now I'm going to forget. Um, but it's sort of that when you um, don't know who you are, you oh, it's the seeing of illusion. It's the seeing of illusion happening. So there is this... Christina, do you know what court I'm looking for? <laughs> Anybody uh, in the crowd? Oh, gosh, I say it all the time, and now it's gone. But anyway... Um, you see it demonstrated. You know, you see it demonstrated. And this gives you a realization of uh, something that's going on in the world. And I think we're seeing demonstrated the ego. We're seeing an, an ego identity accentuated in a way that may very well help us leave our ego identities behind. So that's one way that I would think of it. And... You had so many other questions in there. There was something else, but go ahead, John. <laughs> well, obviously, there's always this, this again, the off on the regression and progression, and so we 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 fall back in some material way, for example, and then that helps to wake us up. We we realize that money's not it, so we're going to move into spirit now, and then another thing will happen: the regress, progress. It's it's, but we always want to be, and I think we are. I said this yesterday. Uh, spiritually speaking, we are growing. We all there's a, there's actually a fantastic growth process going on at the moment, which I said yesterday we see in terms of the death of the church is one example of it. But the, the need that we have to be thinking on our own, to to be reasoning this through. That's a, not being told what spirituality is, but coming to discover it through these new writings, which in some ways are not new. They are new in terms of the level of sophistication with which we're, we can now learn. For example, um, I once asked Ken Wabnick why he thought we got the Course in Miracles. When we, why did this come to us during the latter quarter of the 20th century? And he said he didn't know the answer to that for sure, but there was something he was sure of, and that is we could not have gotten it until after Freud because it wasn't until Freud that we had a really clear ego psychology. So Freud understood this ego thing, but Freud had a problem in that he was an atheist. <laughs> so he didn't see a way out. There was no door. There was no exit. Well, if he had studied Eastern philosophy, maybe he'd realize that there was an exit. But now we come, Helen was a Freudian. <laughs> it was no accident that it was Helen that received this material because she understood how the psyche worked so clearly and understanding how it works you could then put it into this new context through the voice of Jesus but using psychological language because we're in if, if the Course in Miracles had appeared during the middle of the 19th century people would have gone huh? <laughs> I, mean, I mean there may be a few that would have got it but it would but the, they were, wouldn't have been ready for it until, uh, as we are ready for it now. And I, that process is going to keep going as a process. But I wouldn't be surprised if we don't keep falling back and then moving forward and falling back and moving forward as we progress through this whole process, right? We, uh, we're not nearly as, in, in some way, as, as cruel and mean and destructive as before, but we have the potential for it in a more powerful way than ever before, right? There was a hand over here. Uh, you want Give a mic to Mike. Yes, we have a collective consciousness oh, you want to do it, thing huh? here. Yes, um, you got a passage. Yeah, and I uh, thank you very much. And also, I want to say kind of what Mary and I have been experiencing as a collect as part of the collective consciousness. Mm -hmm. And you find it all the time, you know, with people that I hear have a lot of people I only know by email. 
and yet then you meet them and it's like you're both you're you're yearning for the same thing at the same time you know you're yearning for a certain kind of expression you're yearning for a certain kind of creativity you're yearning for connection those kinds of things are always going on uh, and I do think we're in a very heightened time of collective consciousness. I read a quote yesterday about from the treatise on the new, where Jesus says, those born into the time of Christ, they want to learn directly. They, they don't want anybody to tell them what to do. You know, we used to want to fit in and be, you know, like other people. And, and the kids coming up now want to be original. They want to be unique. That's the most important thing to them. And we're all kind of moving towards being our original selves. So I think that's a very exciting um, heightened time, which I might have talked too long and left your let your quote go off here. <laughs> I'm sorry. No problem. You want to take a picture of people? <laughs> For those who weren't here yesterday, this is Colin Stretch, who created our concordance for A Course of Love. And my dear friend, his wife, Christina, provided this quote on Christ consciousness. Because we are one heart, one mind, one self, we can only know ourselves through sharing in unity and relationship. We could only share in unity and relationship through a seeming separation from the oneness in which we exist. This is the great paradox that unites the world of form and the world of spirit, the world of separation with the world of union, even while it does not unite the world of illusion and the world of truth. Sharing in unity and relationship is the way and the means past the world of illusion to the truth of the union of form and spirit, separate selves, and the one self. And just them, this being, this being passed to me is a demonstration. <laughs> Thank you. Well, let's have one gentleman over here, and then uh, we'll kind of begin to wrap it up. Go ahead. Thank you. This question might be for Mary, and maybe you already answered it, Mary. I'm not sure. Um, but I'm interested in becoming available to what's hidden within me. Do you have any like tips about that? What can you speak about? Thank you. Um, for me, it was it was so hidden that it. I had no idea it was there until I opened myself up. I believe that Jesus was uh, so close to me during this time that my union involved bringing what I didn't know was within me out. That I needed light. I was ready for light. I was going to go the whole nine yards for light. And that meant risking, taking a chance. And I was, I feel, I don't know if the word reward is right, but the gift of taking a chance like that was tremendous for me. It, I cannot say enough about A Course in Miracles and A Course of Love. For me, um, there's just gratitude. But I would be very aware of something. For instance, I have clues right now of why it was very hard for me to join things. I was afraid. I needed to protect myself. It took my husband three times to ask me to marry him before I did. I wouldn't even go. After this attack, I met him. And I said, you know, you're a nice guy, but I just, this has happened to me, and I, I just can't go out with you. Well, he kept knocking at my door, and finally I said yes. And maybe that was one of the first chances I took about, my, my, about trust in my hiddenness. But I wanted you to see that there was a pattern in my life about why these things happened. And once that veil was lifted, 
It was all systems go. Now, I could not lift that veil alone. You do not do this alone. So if you can, I, I don't want to say get down on your knees and pray, but my prayer was internal. I needed something so desperately, and it was heard. I want to tell you one thing that I forgot. When I began A Course of Love, I was very hesitant about accepting Jesus as a child I had. But I had this fear, this hidden fear that I couldn't express, and unknowingly at that point. And finally, and Jesus, it was like, just accept me, just that there is no fear. And so finally I began a dialogue with Jesus. And I said, Jesus, you don't know me. I mean, of course he knows me, but you have to understand what I've gone through. And he said to me in this dialogue, Mary, go back to the attack. So I, this is on the computer, I'm writing, and I told what happened. Now I had faulted myself for even being attacked for some reason. Did I not latch the window? What, what went wrong? I, I don't know what was going on. So three times I had to tell him the story of that attack. And remember when I said the words to the fellow that was doing this to me, I said, do you promise? And Jesus said back to me, this is in the midst of reading A Course of Love, he said, this is one of the first times this man ever kept his word, ever kept his promise, and it was to you. I thought of John. I don't know why. But it, there was some connection with something you said yesterday and it was so powerful to me to revisit this wound that I had gone subterranean with I, I went back to work, I went back to school, I did it all, but something had frozen in me that needed to be thawed out and the only, only way was love so I cannot tell you how valuable this is. And I'm, I, I can't speak for everyone, but there's a possibility we, others have had things that have remained locked within. And I cannot tell you, I can tell you, <laughs> I can tell you that it's possible. And if you need to call me or write to me, I'm, my door is always open, Elliot. I have to tell you this morning at the breakfast, Elliot read a poem, and he read this most beautiful poem, and I thought I was still uncertain about what I would speak of, and it gave me so much courage. To, he stood in his truth. There he was, and I'm thinking, this is how connected we are. If Elliot can do it, I can go up there. His was poetry and musical, but I can stand in my truth and say, these are my wounds, this is my healing. Come be in my light with me. I'm all yours. I'm all yours. And so, that's it. Thank you. So um, I have, I, I'd like to ask your thoughts about this because we have been very privileged this weekend to, to be here to um, witness this potential collaboration. It's still the two courses. Um, but so I'm wondering if, what advice would you give to a person who's done neither? Should they start with A Course in Miracles or A Course of Love? I'm asking that because I think it's important there are people that haven't done either. And in fact, what advice would you give to people who have done A Course in Miracles that are leaving that to do A Course of Love? And that, that's something that came to me yesterday. Somebody I met here that used to be part of a group in New York, um, she stopped reading A Course in Miracles to go to A Course of Love. 
So I, I want to present one thing that my partner said to me yesterday. He said, well, what are you doing there? I said, well, I'm, you know, it's Course in Miracles and A Course of Love. He said, oh, the miracle of love. So <laughs> that I thought was profound. And he knows nothing about this. So with that in mind, do you see a, um, that type of collaboration? Will the courses ever become just the course? No. Oh. Or a commentary by both of you that a summation of aggregating the material. I don't know that the course would ever become the course. I mean, they, they are distinct uh, units, but they, they, they are obviously complementary, even though there are some places that we are still trying to polish and to be clear about of some kind of maybe difference, but I think it uh, doesn't make a difference. Uh, I said yesterday that what really interests me, and I know it's true for Joe too and so many others, is what the Course in Miracles calls the universal course. Because there is a universal course which is of which these are both parts and, and is transcended in the book that uh, Richard Alcamp gave me uh, from the Christ mind. That's a part of it too in Way of Mastery. I, we said this yesterday and so many others. This, see, my primary interest over the course of years has been studying mysticism. Well, read Rumi. Okay, so Rumi was written during the 13th century. He's, his de exact dates are 127 to 1273. You're reading The Course in Miracles when you read Rumi. It's or Hafiz, for that huh? matter. Or Hafiz. Oh, yeah, or Hafiz, yes. Yeah. I mean, or, or, or many of them. It's, it's, and that's in my latest book, a, 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 a Course in Mysticism and Miracles, what I do is I compare the insights of about 200 different mystics with the teachings of A Course in Miracles. And so it's just a really kind of a way of saying, well, yeah, but this, this has already been said before. It's, what's different is the packaging. And the, the package, as I said, it couldn't have, The Course in Miracles couldn't have come until after Freud. So it's, psychologically, it's incredibly sophisticated. Right, and now we have another sophisticated book from the 20th and 21st centuries. So that's what makes it exciting that we're just seeing the same thing. It's the the universal course. It's uh, we. I think it's interesting to what look for the characteristics, but we don't have time to talk about what those characteristics are, like non-dualism, love, eternity. You can run down a list, indelibility, etc. <laughs> Okay, folks, we we're, we're looking at thing at the core from two different points of view. Yeah. And I'm going to illustrate this with gender. I'm not gender biased. It's just useful right now. Roll with me. John is going from the uh, A Course in Miracles, which I got a hold of in 1980 and saved my ass, comes from changing our thoughts and our belief systems. Yours comes from the gut, the heart, the emotional center. It is like the two parts of the Star of David or the Seal of Solomon. They come from different places, but they end up on top of the same information. And it doesn't really make a damn bit of difference where you start. You're going to get to the to the center, to the nut, to the kernel. Yeah. End of story. That was very well said. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah. Now, I think we will start to wrap it up here. I want to ask you a question. Do you think we've made progress in the goal of our weekend of better understanding the two courses? I think so. And thanks so much to John and Marlon and Larry for being a part of that. We just want to thank you. So uh, we will be around for a little while. 
Mari and Mary will be around if you'd like to talk with them about the wonderful things they shared. And John will be around. They have lots of booty back here, lots of things, <laughs> lots of things to sell, wares to peddle. All of it's good, and I own a bunch of it. So <laughs> we want to thank everybody for making your part in this weekend, because obviously it wouldn't have been what it was without each of you. So let's say thank you. Thank you. Thank you.